without further ado, um, this is, a, is another talk in our, our value in energy data seminar. The idea is to sort of show what the value is in the digitalization and the collection of data yeah, in the energy sector. And, you know, that means we can talk on a variety of topics uh, about maybe data science, or we can talk about how data is collected or even governance. Um, we've got a really exciting talk about some of the open source tools which are really helping drive some innovation out there. Um, so, um, and I've also used these tools myself and um, it's really helpful using some of the, hopefully, uh, um, maybe I'll talk about that later, the BMRS tool, which is uh, taking some of that market data. Um, and that was really useful for a, for a project that we did at the Catapult. Um, yeah, so yeah, without further ado, let me let me introduce Ayrton. So he's a PhD student at UCL and he's just energy, in the Energy Systems and AI Lab. He's also an Energy Data Fellow with the Climate SUBAC and he's a director at the Future Energy Associates. Um, so Ed has been developed a lots of open source uh, tools. He's going to talk about today about processing and analyzing energy data, um, and he's he's they've used he's used this with a wide range of users from academics to power traders and as I say ourselves at the Catapult. Um, and his research focuses on machine learning machine learning approaches to wind power and market price forecasting. So uh, without further ado, uh, Edson, please uh, take it away. Well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'll jump straight into it. So. Uh, what I'll be covering in this talk are the tools that uh, I've been using for linking, transforming and extracting energy data. And so this differs from some of the previous talks in the series, which have talked about software used for sort of running simulations or analyses on energy data. Uh, but I will give a few examples of uh, where I've used some of these tools uh, in my own research. Uh, and I should also mention that uh, these tools have been built specifically with open source data in mind. Uh, so I won't be talking about uh, authentication or permissions. Uh, but I will touch on some of the issues around licensing. Uh, and so uh, to jump into the first tool I'll be talking about today uh, is the Alexan Data Portal API, which uh, Steve was just mentioning. And so this provides a intuitive interface for retrieving information uh, from one of the largest UK energy data providers. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, the Energy Data Dictionary, uh, which is a project I'm working on at the moment and quite excited about. Uh, and this is supported by an organisation called Climate Subac. Uh, and whilst it's still very much in development, uh, we're keen to get feedback on our pilot, uh, which is focused around linking data related to individual plants, uh, individual power plants. And this project was motivated by what we perceive as a need for automated data extraction and inference. Uh, so instead of just being able to more easily find and search for data. And throughout the talk, I'll be talking about uh, some of the external tools that I haven't developed, uh, but have been really useful sort of in developing uh, these projects and in particular two metadata standards, uh, as well as some of the more general design patterns uh, that we've converged on uh, in this work. So uh, the Alexan data portal. Uh, to give some context, uh, Alexan, uh, who manage the balancing and settlement of power plants on the UK grid, they use a platform called BMRS uh, to share their data for an API. And APIs are application programming interfaces that are used to share data uh, between machines so they can have a common language to talk to each other. Uh, and each of the different data streams available in an API, uh, often referred to as endpoints, which I'll be uh, using to talk about them. Uh, and I sort of found uh, this sort of quote from when the API was initially created, uh, which is that it was designed uh, because many market participants resorted to custom scripting to access data from the BMRS website. And that this had a negative impact on its overall performance. And so the API was meant to take uh, some of that burden, but in my opinion, it hasn't addressed some of the issues around uh, what they identified with lots of custom scripting to access data from the site. And so this has meant that there's lots and lots of replication where people are writing the same code, uh, which can often take quite a while and lots of uh, data wrangling uh, before they can get to the more interesting parts of uh, analysis and research. And additionally, despite being built only around five years ago, uh, there have been lots of changes in the tooling and data formats that are used by sort of modern API developers. And for example, uh, lots of the wrappers uh, that I'll talk about in the next slide uh, use a file format called JSON to pass data around, which is very efficient and you can store uh, data in much uh, sort of smaller sizes. Uh, whereas BMRS use a slightly more verbose language called XML. And I think this is one of the reasons why uh, they have a number of additional quirks, uh, such as you can only retrieve data in half hour blocks. So if you want to find out what the power output of a power plant is for the last year, 
you would have to make uh, thousands of individual requests, uh, in part uh, potentially because of this of large file size. Uh, and additionally, because of the way they require you to specify the half hour, which is in terms of the date and the settlement period, which are the half hour blocks uh, that occur within a day for uh, different wholesale markets. And there are additional complications around how you handle different time zones. So the number of settlement periods in a day uh, can differ. So normally it's 48, uh, but then when the clocks change, you get uh, 46 and 50 uh, respectively. And so there's some additional issues around that. And then sort of more generally, uh, given how widely uh, BMRS is used across the energy sector uh, and sort of the lots of potential gotchas for new users, uh, it seemed like a particularly good example of where even small reductions to the friction uh, for retrieving data uh, can save quite a large number of work hours. Uh, and so that was what's prompted me to uh, build the BMRS API. Uh, but what is the, so build the API wrapper, uh, but what is an API wrapper? And so, uh, wrappers, uh, which are sometimes called clients, are programs which can abstract away much of the complexity that's associated with passing API uh, data uh, around the web. Uh, and without a wrapper, you have to work out how to uh, request your data, uh, confirm it was received correctly, uh, reshape it to your desired format. And then there are normally lots of other post-processing steps, such as checking that data types are correct and additional uh, aspects like date time handling. And so the wrapper removes the need to think about many of these aspects and instead lets users quickly get to analysis ready data uh, where they can immediately start doing analysis. And so uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, and over the last few years, I've created quite a wide range of wrappers for lots of different APIs. And so this is include uh, national grids, uh, as well as the carbon intensity API, uh, the electric insights API, and also uh, other organizations like Optimus Energy. Uh, and this uh, particular iteration of the BMS wrapper, which is in its uh, third version, has been informed by the learnings uh, that I've taken from designing all of these other wrappers. And I had the particular uh, aim with this version to generalize the library, library as much as possible and not have to write separate code for handling specific data streams. And I really wanted to create a sort of solid framework that I could use uh, in going ahead in future to apply to uh, any other wrappers that I create. And I'll be talking about uh, some of those learnings in the talk. And so I'll quickly mention some of the key benefits for the wrapper. So as I previously mentioned, uh, sort of the automated handling of uh, date times, uh, but it also manages multiple requests which need to be made when you uh, want to get data for more than just a single half hour. So it uh, collates and combines all of those individual uh, responses together and then cleans them together. Uh, and then finally, one of the issues I encountered a lot when I was assisting teaching on an energy data analysis module at UCL was that students were often uploading their private API keys online when sharing their analysis. And so for this reason, uh, I added an option for API keys to be loaded in the background uh, without having to explicitly type them out each time you were creating a new uh, script. And then in terms of the usage of the wrapper, uh, it's been downloaded, uh, I just checked today, uh, a little over 150 times in the last month alone. And I've come across it being used in a wide set of teams, as Stephen mentioned, across academia, uh, traders, uh, suppliers, and organizations such as the Electricity Systems Catapult. Uh, but before I can talk about uh, how the library was developed, I need to quickly mention one of the core tools uh, that I use uh, for it, and namely the Open API specification for describing how you interact with APIs. And so within the specification, you could include lots of high level information about data sets such as that author, uh, description and licenses, as well as very specific metadata on each of the different API endpoints. So you can uh, specify what the parameters need to be, uh, the parameters that need to be sent are, the headers that need to be included, uh, and those sorts of aspects. And so the specification itself was started about a decade ago, and has recently had quite a large increase in the number of API developers that are using it. However, I haven't seen so many in the power sector, although there are a few cases, uh, particularly with weather data, uh, where it has popped up a few times. And Icebreaker One, who are the organization who've been working on the energy data visibility project, have been using the open API specification to describe how to retrieve data, uh, not just from APIs, but also static files like CSVs. 
One of the uh, sort of real strengths of the specification is that it's got a very large and active member group who include organisations such as Bloomberg, Google, uh, and surprisingly to me at least, uh, the UK government as well. Uh, and the specification itself is written in a single JSON or YAML file. So each API would just have one file that describes it. And this file can be uh, easily read by humans as well as machines. And I'll show you a few examples of what that looks like uh, in a little bit. Uh, but there's sort of a number of uh, reasons why you actually want to use OpenAPI, uh, which some of which I didn't uh, use for this work. So once you've uh, described it using the, an API using the specification, you can start to use a wide range of external tools that are built around it. Uh, and so these include libraries for running automated tests over APIs to ensure that each of the endpoints work as you've described them. So uh, once you've written the specification, you actually want to check that what you've written is correct. And so this includes tools for uh, how you achieve that. And there are additional libraries uh, which you can use for automated generation of documentation. Uh, and these give you lots of detailed information for each of the different data streams in an API. Uh, one of the examples uh, of which is shown on the right. And what I particularly like about uh, some of this documentation is that it's very interactive. And so users can input their own uh, API key and parameters to run a request and then immediately see what the return data looks like uh, without having to write any code at all. And so this is really useful for uh, introducing concepts like APIs to people who have never come across them before. Uh, and then perhaps most relevant for my use case, uh, there are a number of tools which are able to automatically generate client-side wrappers uh, for almost all APIs that are described through this specification. And so this means that a data provider only has to create the specification once, and they can easily create wrappers in a variety of languages such as Python, JavaScript, C, uh, and R to name a few. And so this focus around writing a single metadata description for a service and then being able to load that data across many platforms is something I'll be coming uh, back to uh, throughout this. Uh, so normally this specification is automatically generated uh, when you create an API server. Uh, and there's lots of uh, really good tools such as Fast API, uh, which do this for you. However, as this wasn't the approach taken by Alexon, I had to create the BRMS specification uh, myself. And so this was actually the most time intensive part of the work and involved manually copying across the URLs, parameters and descriptions from the existing BRMS documentation. And I then used a template for each of the API endpoints that accepted this uh, sort of combined CSV and outputted the relevant YAML uh, metadata or the, the specification. And so an example of what that data looks like for a single uh, stream uh, can be seen on the right. Uh, and one of the things I found particularly interesting was I was immediately seeing some of the uh, benefits from the external tools. So, for example, I was using their uh, test suite uh, to detect whether the requests were correct. And this detected a number of very small errors around things like incorrect capitalization of parameter names uh, or, or misspelt names entirely. Uh, but it also flagged that the majority of the example requests in the documentation uh, were outdated and actually didn't work when you use them. And so, uh, this prompted me to update all of these and confirm that the examples uh, in this current documentation all work when you actually try and apply them. And again, just to reiterate, one of the benefits was I didn't have to write any code around sending these requests to do the tests. This was a sort of single uh, uh, line that I had to run, uh, and then all of that was done for me. So then once you've got the specification, uh, I have to create the actual wrapper itself. And to achieve this, uh, I use a client generator uh, for creating it in Python. Uh, and the, sort of the basic wrapper that's outputted uh, was, was still relatively clunky to interface with. I've got an example on the right here, and that was uh, due to the nature of how the BMRS API was actually designed rather than the client generator itself. So it still had issues such as inconsistent use of terms. Uh, one example being that there were more than six different ways that a start date was described. Uh, so you've, you have to uh, move between uh, lots of different terms and constantly refer to the documentation. Uh, but the automatically generated wrapper was also constrained uh, by issues such as the half hour limit uh, when making requests. And so to address these issues, I added a further layer of abstraction where different types of requests were then grouped together uh, based on their parameters. And so I then specified the ways in which, for example, different date range requests should be handled. 
So for the ones where you had to specify each half hour block, uh, it would uh, iterate over all of them together. And then for other ones where you would uh, request a date range, uh, quite often if you do the large date range, it doesn't return all of that information back to you. Uh, so I had to include additional functionality for handling retries of requests uh, and changing the parameters in those requests to get all of the data that you actually want. Uh, oh yeah. Um, and so that's sort of how the, uh, the full client uh, was generated. And I think uh, Steve posted a link in the chat uh, that's got lots of examples of how you can then use uh, actually interface with it. And so each request becomes very simple. There's a one line of code to initialize the API where you can pass the API key. And then, but then there's only, uh, and then one line for each uh, request, which is very simple. It's just get underscore and then the name of the specific data stream uh, that you're interested in. Uh, but even uh, sort of with the wrapper created and the additional documentation, uh, I often find that it's still quite difficult to work out what data is relevant to your needs. And so to handle this, uh, I recently added a visualization page uh, which highlights some of the key data streams and demonstrates how they can be analyzed. And a few weeks ago, this work was awarded uh, second place in the Energy Data Visualization Showcase uh, that was run as part of the Energy Data Visibility Project. Uh, and these include visualizations on how the fuel mix has changed over the last decade, uh, the power margin forecast across different regions of the UK, and the recent addition of a live and interactive map, uh, which shows uh, which plants in the system are currently producing power, as well as the different fuel types that they're using. But I didn't just want these uh, visualizations to be static. And so we've created a mini framework around them, uh, which handles updating of the plots on different schedules. So for example, the uh, map is every half hour, uh, but the changing fuel mix over decades is only done once a week. And something that I think could be quite useful for other open source tools is that all of these compute tasks are run through uh, GitHub Actions, uh, and the site is hosted on GitHub Pages, uh, which has meant that everything has been very low cost uh, within this project to develop. And so far, I haven't actually had to uh, pay for anything for this hosting uh, or uh, computation. And the visualization page is something that was intended for other people to be able to contribute to as well. And so uh, within the, uh, uh, the website, I've also written a short guide on how users can add their own visualizations using VMRS data uh, to the site. And it would be great to see uh, some new uh, plots on there. And then before I sort of, uh, yeah, to summarize with a wrapper, before I talk about the uh, data dictionary, uh, I'll talk about sort of uh, some of the recent changes and what I see looking forward. And so uh, historically, there have been large amounts of election data which were sold commercially, uh, not available through that API, uh, but thanks uh, primarily to uh, groups such as the Energy Data Task Force, uh, this mindset is now beginning to change and new data sets are being openly uh, released by Alexon. However, these are still uh, mainly shared as static files uh, and aren't available through the API. Uh, and additionally, there are still data sets such as the P114 package, which is a very uh, comprehensive uh, data set on UK power data, uh, which isn't open uh, and, it, and goes back much further in time uh, than what's available on the API. So lots of uh, data such as the uh, specific output of individual plants, you can only get to 2015 through the API but you can then buy to go back uh, much further. And because this is primarily aimed at sort of commercial use cases, it's quite expensive and acts as a barrier for a lot of academic work. And so hopefully this is something that will change in the near future. Uh, in terms of licenses, there've also been some very welcome changes recently. Uh, some of the licenses are far less restrictive, uh, especially around commercial use and republishing of data. However, it's still a custom license that's been written by Lexon. So it's quite difficult to integrate with uh, data portals that provide uh, automated tools for generating non-legalese uh, summaries of different licenses. And it also uh, reduces the ability uh, of other tools which are used for handling derived data from multiple different sources, where you need to work out what the uh, sort of maximum constraints of each license are. And, and when you're using standard licenses, there are sort of ways these can be combined together. But as soon as you introduce a, a new one, um, like this sort of custom Alexa one, uh, things like that are possible. And then finally, uh, the workflow used to create the wrapper uh, proved to be quite successful and highly generalizable. 
And so in future, I plan to rewrite some of the other wrappers I mentioned, such as National Grid uh, Carbon Intensity API, uh, using this same framework. And this is sort of with the long-term plan in mind of creating a meta wrapper that can interface with a wide range of energy APIs and automatically handle the various authentication data that they require. So you'd have sort of one uh, energy data passport that has all of your API keys and then one tool to access all of those different uh, sources. Uh, I'll move uh, straight on to discussing the data dictionary, but any questions on the wrapper I'll come back to at the end. Uh, and to give some context for the uh, data dictionary project, uh, it's supported by Climate Subac, uh, with whom I'm undertaking an energy data fellowship. And now an organization which acts as an accelerator for climate nonprofits. And so this includes groups such as Open Climate Fix, uh, Ember, previously known as Sandbag, uh, and New Automotive. So there's a specific focus on uh, trying to uh, push data-driven organizations. And as part of this, they're creating a data cooperative, uh, which will try and pull the different data sets in these organizations and make them publicly accessible. And my work is focused on how we can improve the links between uh, and discoverability of these data sets. So I think this is a really exciting time to be working on this particular problem. Uh, and the sort of amount of data and tooling has significantly grown over the last few years, uh, again, driven uh, primarily through groups such as the Energy Data Task Force. And projects such as uh, modernizing energy data access, uh, which has led to sort of new platforms where you can more easily find and retrieve data. Uh, and actual other organizations such as National Grid and the Low Carbon Contracts Company have also been putting out uh, new data portals. Uh, and there's always sort of a, a flood uh, of data platforms, so you now need to find out how best to search for the right platform uh, rather than the data set. Uh, but there's also been a focus so far on making it easier for humans uh, to find and get data sets. And I would argue that we've taken sort of quite large strides towards this goal, uh, but it's got us thinking about uh, the potentially new challenges uh, and particularly how we can make it easier for machines to find and extract relevant data. And so there are sort of few crucial parts of this. One of them is being able to look for a column level data, which isn't described in uh, many of the existing platforms. And we also want to be able to search for things, uh, not just data sets. And this requires a way to link different identif identifiers uh, related to the same uh, assets. And this type of matching process is very time consuming and often repeated by different research groups and organizations. And so we wanted to reduce this duplication by creating an open source platform that data analysts and scientists can access and contribute to. Again, enabling them to focus on analysis instead of spending what's often reported is around 80% of that time on data wrangling. And a further challenge we've encountered is this sort of flood of data uh, provider platforms and their differing metadata standards. And in some ways we've, uh, oh, and to address this, uh, we didn't want to just create a new metadata standard, uh, but instead we want to create ways to make it easier to convert between them uh, so that any specific platform can merge different data sets together and express them in the same way. So our solution to these challenges is what we're referring to as a data dictionary, which as a, acts as a bridge uh, when you're merging data. And you don't necessarily need to be merging on the same uh, column IDs. Instead, you can merge on columns that describe the same assets. And so initially, we focused on physical assets, uh, specifically transmission level power plants. However, the framework is equally applicable to other types of assets or even on physical objects, such as, say, uh, GSP or grid supply point zones. Uh, and we've then been working on how the dictionary can be visualized. we have settled on a sort of wiki-like website uh, where each asset can be explored. And currently we've created a proof of concept which just visualizes the different assets. However, the next steps involve creating pages to view the data sets and overviews of different dictionaries. And the sort of core idea within the site is that data exploration becomes more like how we traverse the web, uh, where you're searching for uh, sort of things rather than just filtering for uh, different keywords or themes. We've also been looking at how we can embed machine readable data within these pages, uh, which can enable them to be automatically indexed into platforms uh, such as Google's dataset search. I'll quickly give a demo of what it's looking like at the moment. Uh, so this is what a single asset uh, page looks like. And I'll just search for a London Array Wind Farm. 
And so you immediately get information on all of the different IDs that are related to this particular asset, uh, including things like common name, uh, links to Wikipedia, and in uh, lots of cases, uh, Google uh, Knowledge Graph, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And then it's automatically extracted data from different uh, data sets about this asset. So for example, the location uh, for wind farms included data such as the type of wind farm and the height of the turbines. And then we've also integrated uh, like sort of aggregated data sets like the global power plant database, uh, where you can sort of see lots of information together. And there's lots of benefits to uh, looking at uh, these different data sets uh, in one place for a specific asset. So for example, with the global power plant database, uh, we were quickly able to identify quite a few uh, cases where double counting had occurred. So often in the case of wind farms, they're built over several different phases. And there might be two entries for a wind farm, one for the first phase, uh, and then the second one uh, for the both phases uh, combined together. And so uh, we were seeing much higher capacity uh, relative to other data sets, and we were able to uh, account for that. Uh, we've also uh, recently included data on uh, carbon intensity. And so this comes from the uh, EU emissions trading uh, system uh, where we've or trading scheme. Uh, we've been linking the different uh, power plants to the specific uh, contracts uh, that their uh, emissions are sort of charged through. Uh, and I'll just go back to the slides. Uh, and so with this uh, emission level data and having it on a plant level basis, uh, we were then able to combine it with plant level uh, output data and calculate very specific carbon intensities of different assets on the system. Uh, and so I'll briefly mention one of the interesting insights that came out of this, which is that in the literature, uh, open cycle gas turbines, uh, which are very quick to start up, are often reported as having carbon intensities in the range of 450 to 700 uh, grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Uh, However, this, is, this, uh, this data comes from what their performance is when they're at full load, so operating at maximum output uh, for a long period of time. And the observed data suggested that their emission intensity is actually much, much higher, so almost uh, double in some cases. And the potential reasons for this, or most likely reason, is that they're often operating actually at a much uh, lower capacity and for short periods of time. And in the case of the UK, they're actually limited to uh, 1500 hours in a year. So it's lots of short bursts where the carbon intensity is much higher. And so whilst open cycle gas turbines uh, provide a small share of power overall, uh, in specific uh, markets such as the balancing market, uh, they're much more prevalent. And we could currently be undercounting uh, how uh, the emission intensities of these different uh, sites. And so before I talk about how we develop the framework, uh, I'll introduce frictionless data, uh, which is an open source standard that we used as the basis uh, for all of these dictionaries. And so uh, this is very similar to open API, uh, but instead of the focus being on how you describe uh, API endpoints, uh, it's instead on how you talk about uh, static tabular data uh, like CSVs. And what's particularly powerful about frictionless data is that they provide a comprehensive way to describe individual columns within a data set. And this includes things like that uh, format. So you can do specify the date formats of different columns, uh, which interestingly, for example, in the uh, Alexon data set, sometimes there were multiple different date formats within the same uh, uh, data streams. But you can also include uh, constraints. So for example, for uh, different identifiers, I was able to describe uh, the structure of what a, a balancing mechanism unit settlement ID uh, prefixes. So when I then had a few uh, IDs that were incorrect, uh, they were immediately flagged. And then once a data set has been described using the specification, it then becomes incredibly easy to load it into different languages and export them across a wide range of different formats. So you can take uh, CSV data, easily load it in, and then in one line, uh, converted to say a SQL database. And frictionless data has got a large number of users and I've selected a few here that are sort of more relevant for the power sector. Uh, and so in some cases, for example, the UK data service uh, don't provide the specification for data consumers, but they use it internally for managing their own data pipelines uh, and especially handling the provenance uh, of different data sets. 
And there's a really good group called Open Power System Data uh, that goes a step further, where they're using it not just in their own pipelines, but also for providing guides for users to easily get up and running uh, with using their data packages. And they've written a really good paper on why they chose frictionless, as well as some of the benefits they've received from it. And one example of this is that they were combining data sets from across Europe and encountered lots of differences in formats. So they're often quite uh, simple uh, differences that cause issues like, uh, for example, Germany uses a semicolon instead of a comma for CSVs. But because each of the data sets was described using this frictionless specification, which includes information on those sorts of aspects, uh, they were able to load them all using exactly the same uh, interface uh, and not having to worry about any of those sort of issues. And then again, similar to OpenAPI, many of the standards benefits come from the ecosystem that the community has built around frictionless data. And so one tool I use a lot uh, is around automated data validation. And this can be as simple as checking uh, data types uh, or more complex constraints, such as the uh, settlement ID structure I talked about earlier. And they also have a really good uh, graphical user interface for creating the specifications. And so this was something that's particularly important for us, where we want to ensure that people who uh, aren't coding themselves are able to take a CSV uh, and create the uh, specification so that it can be loaded into our system. Uh, they've also got their own uh, sort of data hub platform, uh, which is uh, for anyone who's come across uh, CCAN, it's sort of it's developed by the same organization uh, and it's sort of a CCAN version too, where you can get much more detailed information on data sets, uh, including, for example, visualizations uh, uh, within them. And I'll share a link at the end uh, to that. And they also include a, a pipeline library, uh, which is really useful for uh, handling data provenance. So you can describe how to combine and merge data sets, and then it will automatically add information about where those uh, sort of initial data sets uh, came from. Uh, and so the dictionary uh, that we've developed extends this standard uh, and in one particular way, which is to create hooks, uh, which can link data together. Uh, but also uh, around describing which attributes uh, within different data sets should be extracted into the dictionary. And so uh, once we've created this, the dictionaries act as sort of central nodes within the data set network, which allow you to move between and combine different data sets. And the components within the dictionary are actually quite simple. So uh, you can think of it as a sort of a basic CSV lookup table, uh, but instead of handling just sort of one to one mappings, it can also do a one to many mappings. And there's the extension to the specification, which allows you to express uh, which data sets different identifiers are then referred to. And so we've tried to increase what we sort of view as the surface area uh, where data sets can link to the dictionary and enabled it so that you can uh, describe uh, which data sets to link to which dictionaries at either the dictionary side or the, uh, the data set end. And so this should make it easier for people to add new resources in a quite a decentralized way and so that was sort of another focus that we wanted to have uh, the ability for other organizations to create their own dictionaries for example uh, you might want one not on uh, transmission level power plants but for say the embedded capacity register but you could then easily link them uh, together and i'll talk about some of the ways that uh, those dictionaries can be merged uh, imminently uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, one of the challenges uh, we encountered when adding different data sets to the dictionary is the range of metadata standards uh, that are being used uh, when they're used at all. And to address this, we wanted to create a way to map between different data specifications. And so this required uh, the use of another specification, uh, which the others can be described in. And the last thing we wanted to do was reinvent the wheel and introduce yet another standard. Uh, so we opted to use uh, DCAT which is a vocabulary for describing data uh, that, is, that has been developed by the World Wide Web Consortium. And this is actively maintained uh, for almost a decade now and is used by a very large number of organizations. And because of how mature it is, there's already a number of existing mappers, uh, for example, between the CCAN uh, metadata standard, which is used by uh, National Grid and the low carbon contract company on their platforms, uh, to DCAT. And by describing the data sets in DCAT, uh, we're then able to create a knowledge graph uh, that can link them together and carry out complex queries on them. And so uh, some people might not be familiar with the term knowledge graph, uh, but might encounter them on a daily basis. So most commonly, uh, you might see the one that's been created by Google, 
where you can see views uh, of it in the boxes that pop up on the side of searches. And this is part of Google's uh, things not strings uh, sort of uh, initiative where they wanted to have uh, will be able to do very complex and structured queries. So for example, uh, what is Brad Pitt's birthday? And you, they link to an object that is Brad Pitt and then has a specific attribute that describes uh, when someone was born and how to calculate uh, age from that. But as well as enabling uh, more complex queries and sort of doing it in a structured way, one of the main benefits is how you can easily merge knowledge graphs uh, together when they're using the same vocabulary. And so this means that if someone else created separate data set catalog uh, for say weather data, we can quickly combine it with our own. I think this is a really powerful approach uh, to solve the issue of having multiple decentralized data catalogs and enabling them to interoperate in a much more streamlined way. And so far, the work we've been doing has involved creating a mapper for, for converting open API specifications to DCAP. And we've been using the BMRS API to trial that. And the next steps involve uh, creating a mapping for frictionless data uh, and then potentially the Icebreaker 1 uh, standard as well. And so part of our aim with this is that you would be able to uh, upload, say, a frictionless data specification and then export uh, sort of pre-populated data on, say, Icebreaker uh, 1 specification where you then only have to add a few extra details before you could upload it to that system. So you want to reduce the friction between uh, moving across different platforms. And I, I briefly want to mention that we originally planned to use a knowledge graph for describing the extracted attributes of different assets. However, we uh, quickly realized uh, after we had lots of uh, calls with different groups who had tried similar things uh, that there were a number of issues with this. And principle among them is the issue that you have to define your own representation of the power system in quite constrained terms. And this often clashes with the a fuzzy nature of how relationships act between power system assets in the real world. And this contrasts with data, which, although we often talk about as being very messy, is actually far more uh, structured and standardized, and therefore has much greater potential to be useful uh, when described in common vocabularies and knowledge graphs. Uh, and then sort of what we're thinking about in terms of the next steps for the dictionary. Uh, one of the things I'm particularly uh, interested in is how we can automate steps such as the calculation of carbon intensities. So if we include information on uh, units and uh, indexes such as time, uh, we can then start working on automated uh, data operations like summing and dividing, and then define uh, aspects such as carbon intensity is the combination of power output uh, and emissions and have that uh, generated automatically without any human input. Uh, I also think that there's potentially a need uh, now that we've, sort of, we've been talking lots about data catalogues, uh, but a need for software catalogues. And so uh, the previous example I talked about earlier with the BMRS wrapper, where you have to convert between uh, dates and settlement periods uh, to date times. Uh, when I was looking on GitHub, uh, I came across three or four uh, different versions of exactly the same thing, where people are replicating the same processes, uh, wasting time. And if there was a sort of central uh, repository where people could find uh, that software easily, uh, there's potentially a lot of uh, time that could be saved. I also think it'd be quite powerful if uh, papers can be linked. So uh, if we could detect when data sets are cited uh, within a paper, we could then add those papers to the knowledge graph. And this, in my opinion, could help motivate researchers to open source much more of their data, uh, as so much within academia is driven by uh, tracking citations and those sort of metrics. And then additionally, uh, regarding licenses, uh, there's a lot of issues with derived data sets. So for example, carbon intensity, uh, the EU emissions trading scheme and BMRS have different licenses. So what should the license therefore be for the uh, carbon intensity derived data set? Uh, and this is something if anyone's uh, been thinking lots about or has any ideas and I'd be really grateful to hear uh, thoughts or get in contact with them afterwards. Uh, and then additionally, uh, we want to look at how we can view special data, such as uh, spatial data uh, or images uh, on the website uh, more easily and sort of automatically infer what they are. And for example, represent spatial data as maps as well. And finally, uh, I want to finish on what I've taken away as some of the key learnings from these projects. Firstly, being that currently the focus, again, is on improving how humans search for data sets. 
And this is perhaps stopping us from thinking about what's needed for the next step in data cataloging, uh, which is that automatic uh, data extraction side. And I also believe that the way we sort of search for relevant data is different to how we search for most other things. And if we can look for objects and assets and then automatically see the data sets related to them, uh, things become much more intuitive. Uh, and I'm always uh, conscious of the XKCD comic around creating new standards to solve the issue. Too many standards. And I think this is especially true as there are already a large number of well-written one, well ones out there uh, that can be extended uh, rather than replaced. And then finally, uh, I want to mention how there's perhaps been too much focus on designing an energy specific metadata standard and how there's lots of benefits in using metadata standards that aren't specific to any domain because of the much larger size of the communities within them that already have very different uh, uh, sort of constraints and edge cases that they're having to handle. But then because of the large communities, there's lots of tools that are being built around them uh, that are very robust uh, and constantly being updated. And uh, thanks again, Steve, uh, for inviting me to present and for all of the different people who have given me feedback on these projects, uh, in particular, uh, Jack Kelly, uh, Dan Travers and Lawrence Watson uh, for the data dictionary. I'll jump into any questions. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Loads of uh, really interesting, useful tools. I've got already some questions actually here, so I'll go through those. But if anyone, anyone else has any other questions and write down on the uh, the chat or put your hand up and I'll you can ask directly. Um, so let's ask a couple of questions, really. Um, what about your BMRS tool about can you access individual bids and offers? Um, I don't think I've used that for that. So I guess could you answer that one first? Yeah. Uh, so my some of my research uh, for my PhD is around forecasting uh, in the balancing market, and I'm using the wrapper to extract those exact uh, bids and offers. And so there's as well as uh, uh, sort of being able to extract the bids and offers, there's additional functionality for cleaning them and getting them into a more usable format. Uh, so, for example, creating the uh, bid and offer stacks uh, rather than just getting the data. Um, actually, maybe a, a further on to that question is, I guess how what's your what's your relationship with BMRS and how how do things like that we well, obviously they will have things you noticed you said you noticed some errors in in the you know the, there is missing names in their own data how do you sort of feed that back and how does that sort of relationship work you know it's been interesting I've, I've had a few things where they've been very very helpful and pointing me to where I can get specific data sets but then generally, I don't think I've been able to get in contact with the right people. And this was something that open power system data had lots of similar issues with when they were trying to contact similar data providers across Europe. And I think they talked about there were only three uh, across Europe that were really good at responding to them. One of them being well, RT, I think, were the best. Um, but lots of issues even around, for example, license questions before they had their new license. I was trying to get more detail on uh, what it could and couldn't be used for. Uh, and I was never able to get sort of a specific answer. And there are other issues around uh, sort of since there's been the new open data uh, sort of initiative uh, and sort of emphasis uh, placed on data providers to open up that data. I tried to contact BMRS about opening up the P114 data set and was just essentially told, no, we don't have that data anymore. It's It's been deleted when it was still being sold commercially to research groups in the same university I was in. Uh, so I think there's lots of issues like that, which I think are just communication problems because it's such a large legacy uh, organization. Uh, in yeah. terms of how those are addressed, I think things like the open data triage system that's now in place is actually hopefully can address lots of those issues. So when I initially tried to contact them about opening up this data set, those options weren't available. Uh, but now if I try to do it through that, potentially there could be sort of uh, more change. Brilliant. Um, a question about licenses here. So um, Robbie Morrison's asked a, a gen general question, but maybe you have some insight on that. Uh, does anyone have independent analysis on the legal compatibility between the OGL UK 3.0 inbound to the CC BY 4.0? Um, I guess the OGL is the, I'm, I'm not too clued on that, but that's the open governmental license, I believe. I'm not, uh, so I haven't come across uh, OGL UK 3.0 in much detail. Uh, but a lot of the data sets that are being released uh, openly are under CC by 4.0. And if possible, uh, and people who are data providers, if they can release data under that, uh, I certainly think it's, it's quite a useful way of sort of making sure that lots of people can access it for 
both research reasons, but also potentially commercial purposes uh, too. Uh, but I think you'd, yeah, probably not the best person to ask on the differences, differences in compatibility between those two specific standards. If anyone has any other comments, yeah, maybe answer in the, if you have, have knowledge about that. Um, Alpesh Doshi asked about whether looking at the open energy from Icebreaker, obviously you mentioned Icebreaker, I guess maybe adding on what would extend that, I, I guess the question I'd be interested in is, um, what's, well, how do you complement that work with Icebreaker, your catalogue and, you know, or what do you, what do you what's the differences? So one of the key things I wanted to make sure that we were doing was not duplicating the same work. And so uh, one of the things we have, were very um, sort of set on was if a data set has been described, say, in the Icebreaker 1 metadata standard, we don't want to have to rewrite that. And so that's where the mappers came in for us, sort of providing a way to convert between all of those different standards and um, sort of, yeah, reduce duplication. In terms of what the key differences are, uh, my, my uh, perception at least, it's the fact that you can describe column level data. And so if you're not describing, if you're just describing the very high level data set sort of description, who's the author, when was it made, you can't do automated data extraction or inference. And I think that there's sort of, um, by focusing so much on sort of what the historic problems have been around searching for data, we're potentially missing what the new issues are around sort of really automating a lot of these sort of steps and sort of different uh, data services. And so that's where I think what we're working on sort of has the biggest difference. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Maitri uh, Day has a uh, link of Neuville has a uh, high resolution solar data sets. Um, as part of a low carbon London project. Um, maybe uh, the, a question there is, you know, with your catalogue, are you interested in sort of, you know, receiving information about other data sets out there and, you know, uh, and sending links, or is there specific ones you're interested in at the moment uh, to add to your catalogue? The remit is very large. So it's not just uh, energy, it's sort of climate uh, more generally. And I know that uh, so Open Climate Fix, so one of the organisations uh, involved in this, uh, always very interested in high resolution solar data sets, now working on uh, sort of solar now casting. Uh, so that's sort of a very uh, useful uh, sort of data set that'd be great to talk more about. Uh, at the moment, we're particularly focusing on tabular data sets and really automating steps around that. However, we are very much looking uh, sort of in the future towards how we can manage really big spatial data files, such as sort of high resolution uh, imagery and that sort of uh, problem. So when if people have particularly sort of uh, different or you know sort of in some ways awkward uh, data sets, we want to sort of talk to you even more uh, to find out how we can make sure that the stuff we're developing now is sort of future proofed uh, for those use cases. Brilliant. Uh, a lot of people want to talk to you as well, so you're you're happy to maybe uh, discuss further further things with them. Uh, Jake's interested um, in the sort of carbon accounting in the digitalization task force, um, so that's some really interesting stuff. Um, and maybe you can get in contact later about that work. Um, Sam Hinton has asked uh, on the top on the, about the BMRS wrapper on the topic of improving how people find and search for data sets. Would you be able to share some recommendations or links that you found useful in your work? And second, about um, is about from someone who has written the BMRS wrapper and lost some of their sanity. How can we most effectively try and influence Alexon, etc., to update the APIs to something better? Uh, I'll try and uh, what I'll do is I can send some links to you after the talk, Stephen, and then if you could sort of share them with other people, that'd be really helpful. Uh, on that second question, what I really want to, if anyone knows how I can get in contact with the right people in an Exxon, that would be great. Because one of the things I would really like to do is sort of push the API specification upstream. So if that's actually managed by Alexon, uh, then lots of these issues would be sort of solved already. And also, I think it would be quite useful, even in terms of their own sort of procedures, potentially in reducing some of the work and bug fixing and identifying errors. So I think sort of embracing those new uh, sort of standards and tools could be really useful. I know that they are working on what was called the foundation platform, but I think it's changed name again now, uh, which is going to be a new system, uh, a new API uh, that they're creating. And that may be using uh, sort of more uh, modern uh, methods and sort of easier ways to get data. Uh, but I'm not too sure. I've signed up for the, uh, to the pilot testing on that, but I still haven't heard anything back since the initial confirmation. Great. Robbie has another question about how copyright persists or not through calculations. So, yeah, that's uh, so that's sort of the point I was trying to address at the end, which is this issue of how do you 
work with uh, derived data sets where the data sets that are uh, drawn from have different licenses. And so there's a sort of similar to some people may have come across a, the grammar of graphics. Uh, there are some people who are looking at the theory and sort of the grammar of licenses and how you can automatically combine them together uh, to always pick, say, the most uh, stringent uh, constraint. But one of the key uh, parts of this is you've really got to be using sort of commonly used standards. And so when uh, people were using very custom uh, ones, or sorry, custom licenses, uh, those sort of systems uh, don't work as well. So in terms of uh, how it persists, I think always take the, uh, the largest or the biggest constraints and probably always link back to the licenses of the original data. Uh, but in future, if people can, uh, where possible, use sort of more uh, general licenses, uh, there's lots of tools that are being developed which could, which could handle lots of these issues. Thank you very much. Generally asks about the, the, the data standards, um, who, you know, uh, the sector or community for handling the data of the standard we can refer to us. I guess um, maybe it's about where you find the standards for those 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 data. Um, how do you find the communities which which deal with that? I think uh, that's uh, I think that's a slightly difficult question. Actually, quite, quite like that question. Um, mainly from just sort of lots and lots of searching and often quite bizarre forums or channels. But there are, I think, lots of good uh, communities. So, for example, um, like uh, Power Swarm or Open Mod uh, can often sort of uh, bring awareness or to these sort of different standards. And use cases, I definitely recommend uh, looking at OpenMod for anyone who's interested in communities that could better help you link uh, to some of these standards. Uh, but I think one of the other things that's worth looking at is the Open Knowledge Foundation, which is an organization that is working on a wide range of standards, uh, sort of issues in this space. And so they've been they're heavily involved with other groups who have developed, for example, CCAN and the data hub I was talking about. And so uh, looking at the Open Knowledge Foundation is a good starting point. Uh, to sort of find some of these other communities. Great. There's a lot of questions still. You've generated a lot of interest here. Uh, there's a question from Maitri Day again on um, what is your thoughts on using Alexon data to validate fault outages events uh, uh, using data using machine learning? Uh -huh. I've got a so I uh, I use the remit data that's published by Alexon to look at the um, failure that happened with Little Barton. Uh, I think it's a uh, year before last, uh, and it shows that uh, the wind farm that tripped tripped before uh, the gas power station. I reportedly uh, published on my Twitter, oh, this is how the trip occurred, uh, based on that data from Alexon. But then it turned out afterwards that actually it happened in the opposite way. So I don't think Alexon is perhaps the best place to get that data, but it's also not that Sort of fault in a way it's the it's remit data perhaps isn't being published as often as it should uh, and it's it's sort of a legally binding uh, data that i meant to submit and it's meant to be very accurate but sometimes those date times don't exactly match up so i wouldn't uh, use it as a sort of a ground truth uh, always even though that is uh, what it's meant to be uh, used for thank you Sam Hinton um, mentions about using forbidden office stacks using the death size prices, death size prices report. Um, I guess if you is that um, have you looked at that that's, before? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the one. So uh, for example, to interface that from the API, you would just have the uh, the, the API object dot get underscore and then death size prices, uh, and then you would pass the date range in, and it would return all of that data uh, back to you, sort of in a cleaned up form. And uh, David Phillips has a, I think that's just an answer to someone else further up about the open source licenses. Derivative works all inherit the permissions and obligations to share. Um, Jake asks about your approach to knowledge graphs. Uh, in our bid for the Energy Data Visibility Project, we discussed designing a knowledge graph versus self-generated based on meta metadata. The former is better for specificity, uh, but the latter seems to be the preferred option for scale. In my view, the latter is embedded in, embedding bias gradually into the outputs of searches Potentially, this is not an issue right now, but may become an issue the more consumer devices participate in the energy system. We'd be keen to hear your thoughts. Hmm. Uh, I think I have to think about a bit more about that one, but I'll get back to Jake uh, yeah. with the uh, carbon intensity question as well. Brilliant. Uh, David, again, 
talks about IP, uh, separate pieces of IP pipes through the OSS calculation is an interesting one, but this is not the legal, uh, this is not legal advice, but I don't think the mechanisms are usually considered derivative to the OSS software IP itself. Any comments on that? I think, I think that's referring to sort of the differences between licenses for data and licenses for software and how uh, it, so sort of for the output data sets, all that matters is, I think what's being said here is the uh, licenses of the initial data sets. And that's my assumption, uh, but I, I wouldn't give uh, legal advice on that myself. Uh, but I think that's uh, that's correct. That was Brilliant. the intent. That was the intention. Thanks. There's a few other people who'd like to talk to you, so they've sent their e email addresses in there, so we'll, we'll get you in contact. Uh, Maximilian, uh, Maximilian Parzan has shared uh, an open energy system model. Thank you for that. We can um, keep that in the chat later anyway. Um, another person wants to talk to you, so you're very popular uh, today. Um, so uh, on that, yeah. one, so I saw, I saw uh, Pi PSA on, uh, I think it was Power Source or one of the other communities, but looked really interesting. Uh, and in terms of, sort of scaling beyond the UK, that's something that we're uh, sort of thinking about from the start. So specifically with the carbon intensity data, we're actually uh, planning to do it for the whole of Europe. And so uh, we're just sort of using the UK as a pilot at the moment. In terms of sort of other continents, we haven't thought about that too much already, but there's lots of good work, for example, in America by uh, PUDL. Uh, I can't remember what the acronym stands for off the top of my head, uh, but they're worth checking out. Uh, and I'm not too sure uh, for places uh, elsewhere. Brilliant. I think that's all the questions. Is there any other questions? So if anyone wants to put their hand up or any more. Um, I think that was quite a lot anyway. Um, yeah, so without further ado then, yeah, I think thanks a lot. Um, so we'll get, we'll put anyone who wants to get in contact. Oh, so we have one more question. So we'll do, this is the final question then. So Tala, yeah, if you want to go ahead. Yes, um, it, it just comes back to something you said a bit earlier, going away from just the Alexon data. Um, if we wanted to, is the dictionary also working towards enabling us to collect data from non Alexon sources? For example, Google texts. I think you, you mentioned that weather pattern data, other data, and bring it all together in a usable way. That's very much uh, the intention. And so uh, one of the things that uh, doing at the moment, but isn't on the dictionary, was taking, for example, all the Wikipedia and Google data that's uh, available for specific power plants and adding that in. At the moment, uh, it's only actually output, uh, power plant output data from Alexon that's on the dictionary. And all of the other data sets were uh, from other data providers, such as the EMIT European Trading Scheme or Carbon Trading Scheme and the global power plant database. So it's very much uh, non-specific uh, in terms of which data providers uh, can be integrated with it. The, the key is that the data sets can be described using, uh, at the moment, the frictionless data specification, uh, but also uh, as we build the mappers in, uh, the Open API or Icebreaker 1 or potentially CCAN uh, metadata standards as well. So it's more about has the data set been described uh, in a way that enables that automated extraction. And once it has, uh, we can integrate them in. Brilliant. Thanks for the questions. Thanks very much. So uh, what I'll do is, so the, this is being recorded, so we'll share this after I, I'll, I'll send the email to everyone, uh, it, but it'll be on our, it'll be on our YouTube page. Um, uh, and we'll, I'll share all your contact details with Ayrton after, so you can get in contact um, and continue the discussion. Um, I want to thank Ayrton for, for joining. That was a brilliant talk. So many great tools and, and things I think that can really help. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for coming and taking all the questions. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. And um, yeah, as I say, oh, I'll-, I'll Thanks for having me and organizing it. It's really good.